What's up? So for the first task that I want you to do, just so everybody's on the same page and kind of gets the general context of the situation, I've got the slideshow that just goes through um, some of the broad strokes of the African American Civil Rights Movement from uh, post-World War uh, two, sort of, but mostly focusing on uh, Brown v. Board of Education going up into into the 1970s. Um, after 1980, you have things like um, the war on drugs, more affor affirmative action, kind of white flight, um, things like that that um, affect African-American communities that hopefully you'll see in that last task with the video. But I'm going to go up until about like into the 70s with this part. <clears throat> So the first thing or kind of topic what we'll look at is what was society like in the 1950s for African Americans in the Jim Crow South, but also in the North, which was also very segregated at that time. So there's about 15 million African Americans in, uh, in 1950 in the United States and about two thirds lived in the South. So when those Jim Crow laws, uh, even though they were only taking place specifically in the southern uh, states, it still impacted a large um, amount of African-American citizens. So if you're unfamiliar with Jim Crow laws or you want some, I think I, the last day of class, we like looked at a handout of them, but there's a variety of different social arrangements that try to keep blacks insulated from whites or kind of vice versa would be a better way to think about it. They want to try to protect white people from, from African-Americans or integrating with African-Americans and um, both intentionally and also as a side effect in some cases led to just economically inferior and politically powerless positions for African Americans. Here's an example, only about 20% of those eligible to vote in the South were registered, sorry, in, in the deep South when we're talking like Louisiana and Mississippi, especially, especially Mississippi, uh, that was fewer than 5%. If you're interested, I'll put the slideshow um, that you can open up as well because this uh, link right here uh, shows you kind of the steps that an Af average African American would have to go through in order to vote um, in the, the Jim Crow South during this time period. So there's a couple things um, that kind of kept America segregated. Not only were the laws in place, the Jim Crow laws that tried to keep segregation uh, in place throughout the South, but there was also armed violence from vigilante committees like the KKK and the White League and other groups during that time. So there's a couple examples. Most famously uh, was the case of, let's see if I can get this pen to work right here. Yeah, nice. Okay. Was the case of Emmett Till, uh, a 14 uh, year old African American boy who was killed in 1955 for allegedly leering. The, the story is that he kind of like whistled at a um, white woman in a convenience store and a posse of um, white men took him and, and brutalized, brutalized him and then murdered him. And there's a picture of he had an open casket because his mom wanted the world to kind of see what, what they had done to him. Um, but those the white men that ha had perpetrated this activity uh, were eventually let free and, and found not guilty by an all-white jury. And that was kind of one of those focal points that showed the inequality in society. Um, also, this was kind of a global thing. So throughout the world, um, Jim Crow was a pretty unique institution to America in comparison to other countries, nations that you would uh, compare America to. So actually places like the Soviet Union, um, Western Europe, uh, this was a unique institution. Now you did have countries like we'll learn about later, like South Africa, which would be instituting apartheid around this time as well. But in terms of societies that are directly comparable being in the first or second world during the Cold War. Um, this was kind of a thing that was unique and a lot of um, Americans contemporaries at this time look kind of looked down on this and, and thought that this was this was definitely a negative thing that was going on. Um, if my face is in the way, this was a KKK rally burning crosses, just more intimidation in the South during this time. Um, actually, the KKK had died out. Uh, it had its second revival kind of in the 1920s, died out a little bit, and then kind of makes its um, uh, comeback during this time. This is also, um, if you look into the history of like, if, if you're into kind of the arguments around the Confederate monuments and the Confederate flag and things like this, this is where you see the Confederate flag actually make a comeback. So the Confederate flag um, had kind of gone away and it really came back in being put on display in the South during the 40s, 50s, and 60s as kind of an intimidation 
uh, to African Americans, just as a side note. So also keep in mind you had the Nadir, Nadir reading, but um, racism was not just in the South. There was a lot of problems uh, with discrimination in the North, but we don't usually consider it Jim Crow um, segregation um, because it wasn't to the extent of the laws that that the South had. But there was a lot of uh, discrimination, and um, because of that discrimination. Even though it wasn't specifically put in the laws, there was segregation in the North. So there's just a couple examples for you from uh, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, sh and Chicago. As well. um, and I wanted to can I get my face out of there. I'm sorry, people. Um, wanted to just clarify because um, this is just good vocabulary in general for historical and political knowledge, but also it's important to understand this time period. Um, so there's two types of segregation that historians and sociologists tend to look at. And the first one is the most obvious, which is called de jure segregation, which is where it's legalized within the law. And when you think of Jim Crow laws in the South, that's what you're thinking of. So things that specifically within the legal system separate African-Americans, like having segregated schools, water fountains, um, parks, all those kinds of things. But then there's also this type that becomes more prominent later on in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even today, which is called de facto segregation, which means that it's not because it's not a specific law that creates segregation, but because of policies that are not on their face discriminatory, um, you have this effect where African Americans are separated from the white population. So some examples of that are redlining, which is where you know, they, the surveyors of different cities would draw these red lines around undesirable locations for new housing um, construction and real estate and things like that. And generally, those would be places where there would be social and racial minorities. Um, white flight, so um, white people being able to move it into suburbs out of the urban areas and kind of leaving the African-American population behind. Um, Federal Housing Administration regulations on home loans and funding. So a lot of African-Americans would be shut out from um, preferable uh, loan environments and policies so that they weren't able to get housing out in the suburbs or in the more desirable locations that people would be moving to when you think about kind of the 50s and 60s moving up into that middle class area. So those are examples of de facto segregation, not specifically laws, but they're policies that even though on their face, don't say that they're discriminatory or don't have, you can make an argument, don't have the intention of being discriminatory, but they still led to segregation. And that's going to be a focal point later on in the, in the movie. Um, there's a couple social or social Supreme Court rulings in the 1950s that were actually before Brown v. Board of Education were demonstrating that America was moving towards a more integrated society. And a lot of those were brought up by the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, or the NAACP, which was a organization that had been around for a long time promoting African-American uh, rights since the 1900s with its founder, W.B. Du Bois. Um, but they had been, been really trying to focus on using legal channels and the legal system in general to fix segregation. So there's three examples right there of various ways that um, African-Americans tried to, was this it? Turkey. There we go. Okay. Um, that African Americans tried to um, kind of assert their right during this time period. But the big one that you've probably all heard about before is Brown v. Board of Education at Topeka, Kansas. In 1954, it ruled that segregation in public schools is inherently unequal and thus unconstitutional, and it reversed the court's verdict in Plessy v. Ferguson that said that separate but equal facilities were constitutional, which enshrined segregation as being a constitutional practice. So this throws that out the window. Um, which is a huge turning point, and this is generally where people say the civil rights movement kind of begins with this court ruling. Um, I gave you just an excerpt, uh, or sorry, some excerpts from the majority um, opinion in the case. Uh, it talks about how um, we can't just look at tangible factors like the facilities. We have to think about what the effect on people is going to be from having this separation, especially in public education. Uh, they talk about the importance of education in, in determining your quality of life, and then therefore saying that having separate schools generates a, quote, feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely to ever be undone. So kind of looking at some of the intangible factors of segregation being negative on African-Americans and on society as a whole.
Um, now that wasn't, that's just specific to, to schools. It didn't say anything about other, um, accommodations or public policy. So there's actually a second opinion that comes a, a year later, which says that it's called the Brown two decision, but it's this extra little oomph that they add on to it. That says that now actually we need also need to apply this to the rest of the country at this time and think about our public policies and desegregate. And they said that desegregation must go ahead with quote unquote all deliberate speed, which does not give a very great indication of the time period that they're looking for. So right away, like the North kind of already had, didn't really have de jour segregation at the time, but the border states, so states in the upper South, like Maryland and Delaware, um, Virginia, uh, they they tend to comply pretty early. And then you've got the deep South where you have organized massive resistance within both local governments, state governments, and representatives in, to the federal government in Congress. And they, um, Rachel Lucy can tell you more about this from her IA, but they have the Southern Manifesto, which I do have a copy of if you're interested in reading it, but it kind of, it was signed by a bunch of Southern politicians. Um, again, mostly Democrat during this time, uh, pretty good stronghold, but Democrats, Republicans alike, um, from the South that want to see segregation maintained. Um, some states divert their public funds to start private schools to try to break away from integration. And then within the next 10 years, fewer than 2% of eligible blacks in, deep South, in the Deep South um, were in classrooms with, with whites. So it, it didn't happen very quickly at all, um, even though that the, the Supreme Court ruling said that it had to. Um, here's some other results and significance. So the Supreme Court didn't give a deadline, again, regarding de facto segregation. You also had in opposition uh, the White Citizens Council, which formed throughout the South to defend segregation. So there's, there's again, you see this uh, Confederate, this, these symbols of the Confederacy come back during the um, kind of the, the aftermath of the Brown decision. Um, the KKK was revitalized. And again, you've got a lot more activism that was inspired from the African-American side to challenge segregation. So one thing that I wanted to stop on right here is it's important from a legal aspect to explain the difference between the Constitution and statutes. So the Constitution or a Supreme Court ruling on a constitutional right like the 14th Amendment, which was the basis for Brown v. Board of Education, it can only dictate what the federal government, well, technically the federal government, but it's been incorporated to the states. It can only dictate what the government does. So if you've got um, a ruling like Brown v. Board of Education, which says that segregation is unconstitutional, what that means is that the government cannot pass policies to enforce segregation. It can only affect the government. It does not say what private individuals can and cannot do. So if you're a store owner at this time, regardless of what Brown v. Board of Education says, absent any type of law to the contrary, you can still discriminate against your patrons, you can still discriminate against your employees if you want to based on race, because Brown v. Board of Education and these constitutional rulings only affect the federal government. So that's why, if you're wondering like, why, why did these movements push for legislation um, about segregation after Brown v. Board of Education, it's because of that. It's because that ruling does not impact private citizens. If you want private citizens to um, be held accountable for discrimination and segregation, then you have to pass a statute or an actual law passed by Congress that says segregation is illegal. So I just wanted to make that clarification because it doesn't always get clarified for people when we're talking about how these events um, work out. Okay, so the first big event, and I had a video clip to it, which is like the classic event that kicks off the movement is the Montgomery bus boycott. So um, you had, again, in 1955, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat or, or at least move to the back um, because it's not technically a whites only section, but she had a spot where the, the, the law was you could sit wherever you wanted, but if a white person wanted your seat, then you had to move to the back and she refused to move to the back. Um, and that kicks off again. They had been planning this kind of boycott for a while. It's not like some kind of impromptu thing that happened. It was something that was, that was meticulously planned and carried out. Um, in fact, Rosa Parks, she didn't, she, she had planned on doing this. Um, so you had a 381 day boycott, which ended when the Supreme court said that laws requiring segregated buses were unconstitutional. So local laws, 
that um, segregate buses were unconstitutional. So that was overturned. Big victory for the civil rights. Um, you also have uh, President Eisenhower, Republican president during the time that uh, was trying. He he felt that. He, it's kind of an interesting situation. There's a lot of perspectives on this, but he kind of felt that people have to kind of come to their own um, conclusions about integration, and you don't. He didn't want to push people too hard to accept integration because he felt like that would be bad overall um, for for like the I don't know the, the like morale of, of of America or something like that. But in 1957, he was forced to act because the governor of Arkansas refused to allow um african americans to integrate in little rocks central high school which is like the first big high school that was going to be integrated so that you might have heard about the little rock nine before these are the students that were um refused entrance into the high school so he sent in uh federal troops to escort children to their classes so actually sending in the military to protect these students as they go to their classes i have a clip about that um in my materials as well so federal government taking actions. So really quickly, hopefully, I'm going to run through some of the major groups and events that occurred to give you a broad spectrum of what was happening before you can kind of dive into some of the more perspective-based things. Um, so Martin Luther King formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, in Atlanta in 1957, and it had a religious base. Uh, it mobilized black churches on behalf of black rights, and it was a big organized institution um, that played a huge role in black activism and advocating for african-american rights uh at the beginning and into the 60s as well they kind of kind of lose um influence later in the 60s and into the 70s as you have a little more radical movement take place um, but early on major actors in the civil rights movement um, here's some things that they're doing. I kind of broke it down by um, who the major people were, the methods, and then the things that they did. So their methods were really centered on nonviolent direct action to draw attention to abuses. They call it, they didn't call it, I mean, they referred to it this way, but this goes all the way back to Henry David Thoreau, but civil disobedience. So disobeying unjust laws, accepting the punishment, doing so publicly and civilly. So here are a couple different things that are of note of the SCLC. So they're involved in the Montgomery bus boycott, obviously, uh, the March on Washington, the Birmingham campaign, which challenged segregation in the South's most segregated city, in Birmingham, Alabama, and also the Selma March in 1965, which was for voting rights and a new Voting Rights Act. So they were kind of at the forefront of all of the major events that took place in the late 50s, early 60s. So you think Martin Luther King, you think SCLC, or when you think SCLC, you think Martin Luther King, that was his big organization that he helped found. Um, but even kind of, bef I mean, after the um, Montgomery bus boycott, you know, that was a big move for the SCLC, but this, the big movement that started to challenge segregation in private um, businesses was the sit-in movement, which was organized by the, the, sorry, not the SNCC or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So that started in 1960. Um, in Greensboro, North Carolina, by four black college freshmen, which they just demanded service at a whites-only lunch counter. Um, the major one that took place was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, but they got more and more focused on direct action, and these were young um, college students uh, that got involved in nonviolent protest of segregation, especially in private spheres. Um, so there's a little bit more um, information. Later on, the SNCC becomes much more militant um, and radical in its uh, methods um, and, and at times promoting or advocating um, violence, not, not violence like unprovoked, but self violent self-defense. Uh, they formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party at, in 1964 to kind of form a secondary African-American based uh, political party, and also they're active in Selma, but they did clash a lot with SCLC, especially thinking about how quickly things should move. SCLC was a little more um, wait for public approval kind of outlook, whereas SNCC just kind of wanted to go and go now and, and get things done. The Congress on Racial Equality doesn't come up a lot because they were very active early on in the beginning of the movement and then kind of take a backseat to other things that were going on. But 
but they were active way back in the 1940s, challenging de facto segregated restaurants, encouraged sit-ins and direct action as well. So a lot of these organizations are centered on direct action. The Freedom Rides were a major action done by CORE. So that was the idea that you would take whites and blacks, mostly young people, and protest segregated busing because buses were supposed to be unsegregated at this time, but there still was a lot of segregation as practice in the South. So they would ride these buses from the North into the South to demonstrate integration, basically. That was it. They're, just, they're just kind of just demonstrating and facilitating interstate travel that was integrated. And the Southerners did not take too kindly to that, so there's a lot of violence that was perpetrated against them. In May 1961, you had a white mob that torched one of the buses, which is what this is a picture of here. Also, they weren't going to let them get out of Montgomery, um, so basically they had to try to dispatch um, federal troops to try to protect them. And that was another example of the federal government becoming more involved in the civil rights movement protecting the Freedom Riders as they went through because this was an interstate commerce situation. So the federal government claimed jurisdiction over helping them. This is a picture from the Birmingham campaign when they brought out the fire hoses. So I didn't have a slide I noticed about the Birmingham campaign, but that was really the big challenge to segregation uh, orchestrated by SCLC. Again, nonviolent protest that was met with violence, and they actually used children in the campaign to try and kind of, again, coalesce public support for integration. And this is one of the major events that leads to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which we'll get to in a second. Also, um, Martin Luther King is, is put in jail during this time, and he writes his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which I'm happy to give you a copy if you'd like to to read it, but it's, a, it's about his philosophy of nonviolence and direct action in the movement. So you have these movements that go on in the early 60s, and then you have the events that eventually lead to securing voting rights and also ending de jure segregation overall in the Jim Crow South. So one event that it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about was the March on Washington, which was a 200,000 member peaceful march. You had the I Have a Dream speech. Violence still continued after this. Um, there was a, a murder of Medgar Evers, who was a Mississippi civil rights worker. In September 1963, there was an explosion at a Baptist church in Birmingham, which killed four black girls. And the civil rights bill stalled in Congress. So despite the fact that they're active doing these marches um, that involve both whites and African-Americans, there still wasn't a lot of legislation that was being passed, and they continue to push for this over time with nonviolent direct action. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 finally passed in, believe it or not, 1964. But here it did pretty much three big things. It gave the federal government more power to enforce school desegregation orders. If, if schools weren't abiding by desegregation orders, then it gave the federal government power to step in. Because you have to remember, with our system of federalism, states are under, or sorry, School districts are under state and local control, so this gave the federal government the ability to come in and say, no, you're, you're doing this, you're desegregating. It also, and this is the big thing, it gave car, the federal government the power to prohibit and regulate racial discrimination in public accommodations and employment. So by public accommodations, we mean businesses that are open to the public. If you're going to be open to the public, you can't discriminate based on race. You also can't discriminate your employees based on race as well. So it made segregation racial discrimination specifically illegal both in the public sphere and from private citizens as well. So it kind of comes around full circle. You've got the government cannot discriminate after Brown v. Board and now it's unconstitutional and now you've got private citizens if they're going to open their businesses to the public they can't be discriminatory either. So that was great and it was a huge win for the African American civil rights movement but it didn't accomplish anything related to voting. So you can see some statistics here, especially from Mississippi, because Mississippi was known as the worst place for African Americans voting. So only 5% of eligible blacks registered to vote in Mississippi in the 1960s. Um, sorry, only 5% of eligible blacks were actually registered. It was very similar throughout the South. You had a lot of ballot denying devices. So they would have the poll tax where you had to be up on your taxes in order to vote. 
um, literacy tests, which I have an example of right here from Louisiana, but you can check out other ones from different, they're very different across different states. Um, just intimidation in general. So for example, Mississippi would publish the names of prospective black registrants. So they would say, hey, these people are potentially going to register to vote or are registered to vote. And they would publish that in newspapers to basically um, allow people to intimidate them. Or if you had an employer and you didn't want your, your African-American employee voting, you could try to um, retaliate against them economically as well. So a lot of just nasty stuff that was going on um, during this time to deny African-Americans the right to vote. Um, so in 1964, you had a couple of things. The first one was you had the 24th Amendment, which actually is constitutional, which says that you cannot have a poll tax in federal elections. So you cannot have a tax that people have to pay in order to vote. That's an unconstitutional measure. So that was a big win for African Americans, but it didn't say anything about intim intimidation, literacy tests, um, and the various other methodologies that uh, people would use in the South to deny African Americans the right to vote. The Freedom Summer, not to be confused with the Freedom Rides, but in 1964, African Americans and white volunteers joined a massive voter registration drive in Mississippi, kind of went all throughout the South. And in early 1965, Martin Luther King and the SCLC resumed a voter registration campaign in Selma, Alabama. So 50% of the city of Selma's population was black, but only 1% of, it, of its population could vote, um, or they only made up 1% of the voting population in Selma. Um, there was a lot of violence and intimidation that occurred, and you eventually had the Selma to Montgomery March. Um, you might have heard of Bloody Sunday, but you have um, a, a march that is eventually allowed and protected by the federal government to protest uh, voting rights in Alabama. And eventually, this direct action and, and working with the federal government leads to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which did a few different things. The first thing it did was say that you cannot have literacy tests in order to, you know, a requirement for voting. Uh, and then the other thing that was probably a bigger deal was it sent federal registrars into several states to oversee elections. So no longer could, could states that were discriminating um, run their own elections. They had federal oversight which allowed people to actually, um, one, register to vote, but also not be as worried about facing that intimidation. And soon blacks began to migrate into the South. Like they actually started moving into the South for better opportunities for the first time since the emancipation of African-American slaves, uh, which also gives an indication of how things were going in the North at that time as well. So Civil Rights Act, 24th Amendment, and Voting Rights Act are kind of the three big um, government actions since the Brown v. Board of Education that are taken that are kind of focal points of the civil rights movement. So that's, to be honest though, in 1965 is where like people's education on the civil rights movement kind of ends. It's like, okay, yeah, they got all these rights and now everything was great and, and that's the end. But that's not, that's only like half the story and your understanding of the civil rights movement and its impact really depends on where you decide that the movement ends, which is why it was one of my essential questions. So many would argue that as you go through 1965, you start to see the movement change quite a bit. Whoops. Oh, man. Oh, my. Well, there was no coffee in it, but there was a coffee. Glass. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, so the last big legislative victory of Southern Focus Integrationist Civil Rights Movement was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What started to happen is you saw this shift that occurred where they started to focus more on the struggles of the urban north against discrimination and police brutality. So one big event that was kind of a turning point was the riot in, in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. So I have um, the video clip from Eyes on the Prize that talks about it, but you just have this massive, it started with um, an instance of police brutality, which led to a riot, which led to looting, which led to violence, which led to property destruction and the killing of both blacks and whites um, in the neighborhood. So you can see that things, even though, I mean, this was five days after the Voting Rights Act goes into effect or gets signed by President Johnson, and, and there's still some issues, tons of issues that are going on um, throughout various urban cities in America, especially in the North. And this was kind of a shift um, in the movement to what we call black power, which is a 
it has various different connotations, but it was a shift in, to militancy, more radical movements and separatisms. If you're thinking back to kind of the idea of the anatomy of a revolution, even though this isn't a government revolution, you can kind of see that you have um, kind of this period where the moderate group of the African Americans kind of takes power, quote unquote, and then you see this shift to more radical groups as well. Um, so in 1967, you've got more riots in urban ghettos. So Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, both have very bloody riots, um, just like Watts. Uh, a lot of white Americans are upset about this. They, they feel like, okay, you can protest, you can be nonviolent, but once these things get violent and ugly, uh, you kind of lose the support of the white community. <clears throat> and then also, a lot of people that always thought that uh, discrimination and segregation were Southern problems start to realize that this is something that's going on in the North as well, even though it's a little bit different in its nature. Um, I'm going to see, just for the sake of time, I'll kind of look at where I want to spend my time here. Um, a lot of the these uh, issues that are focused on in the North are on residential discrimination and how whites were leaving the suburbs, how there was less economic opportunity and even economic discrimination against blacks in the North. Uh, for example, black unemployment was nearly double that of whites in the late 60s, early 70s. Or 70s. Um, so these were issues that they were trying to focus on, especially economic equality, which was a transition for the movement. Uh, tension hits a peak in 1968, not only because contextually you have um, protests over the Vietnam War, you've got the Tet Offensive, but also Martin Luther King is assassinated on April 4th. Robert Kennedy, who is running for the Democratic nomination, is killed a few months later. So you've got a lot of tension in the United States over a variety of various um, social um, issues. But uh, there's a lot of rioting going on uh, both in the South and in the North in 1968. So here's some kind of accomplishments. So by late 1960s, several hundred blacks had been elected in the Old South. Uh, you also in the in northern big cities in the north had started electing African-American mayors. So Cleveland, Ohio um, and uh, Gary, Indiana, both elected black mayors. Um, I was going to Carl Stokes. That's his name. Cleveland, Ohio. Carl Stokes was was um, elected mayor. Uh, by 1972, you had nearly half of Southern black children in integrated schools. More schools were actually integrated in the South and in the North. And again, this is part of that de facto segregation. So because of where people lived, you actually had more segregation in the North than you did in the South because the South had done so much effort in, in like specifically intentionally integrating itself during this time, whereas the North had a lot of residential segregation, which still permeates society today. And then about a, th a third of blacks had actually rid risen into the middle class. So by the time you get into the 70s, you actually have a lot of strides being made by African-Americans as a result of the movement and federal action that occurred. So I think, yeah, that's where I'm going to stop, stop for now. I have the slides on other minority groups, but that kind of gives you a broad overview on the major accomplishments and, and like the who's who of what was going on. But what I'd like to do is have you look at some of those other materials and kind of look at who deserves most, most of the credit for uh, the strides African-Americans make. How are you going to, how would you periodize this time period? Um, when does the civil rights movement kind of begin and end? Does it go through multiple phases? Does it ever end? Um, and then also, how how successful would you say that the African American Civil Rights Movement is or was, and and how do we define success historically? Because when we look at other movements and we look at apartheid, for example, we can draw a lot of comparisons in terms of uh, methodologies, ideologies, tactics, and accomplishments and setbacks, and and kind of understand the perspectives a little better. So I'll leave you there. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll talk on. Uh, Wednesday, the 22nd.